Welcome everyone who's joining us. We'll be starting in just a couple of minutes. We're waiting for uh, the rest of the participants to come online. For those of you just joining us, please give us another minute as we wait for other participants to come online. Hi everyone, thank you for your patience. Just a little bit longer and we'll get started about another minute or so. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending on where you're calling in from. My name is Amy Regas, and I'm the managing partner of Place Fund. I'd like to thank you for joining today's discussion on leveraging technology to accelerate land administration during COVID-19 and beyond. I would specifically like to thank our colleagues at Cadasta and Land Portal for their hard work in or organizing this event. And of course, thanks to our esteemed panelists for preparing and sharing their thoughts today. Using technology to overcome development challenges is not a new phenomenon. However, the pace at which technology is transforming all aspects of our lives and our work is unprecedented. Today, we live in a hyper-connected world of smartphones, satellites, machine learning, artificial intelligence, inexpensive cloud-based computing, and other technological breakthroughs. Within the broad development sector, we've seen new technology uses such as crowdsourced real-time tracking of flooding in Asia, satellite imagery's ability to detect illegal logging in the Amazon, and delivering vaccines by drones in Africa. Technology advances have also positively affected the land sector. Smartphones, tablets, computers, handheld GPS, drones, and earth observation imagery are now part of our toolkits to collect and manage data about land and resource rights and uses. Prior to COVID-19, technology had already become an important factor in enabling faster, easier, and less expensive land administration. It has allowed communities to document their own rights in instances where authorities have been unable to do so. However, with pandemic-related restrictions, we've seen efforts to map and document property rights come to a complete halt in many locations. Today, our panelists will discuss how COVID-19 has affected land administration work in Uganda, Zambia, Ghana, and India, among other places. And they'll talk about ways technology may, may help overcome some of the challenges we're now facing. Among questions we'll consider are whether there are successful technology-based approaches to land administration or lessons learned during the pandemic that can continue into the future or when looking at how technology is being used in other sectors to address COVID-19 challenges, what are some of the lessons and trends that can be applied to the documentation of land rights? We'll begin today with 10 minute presentations by each of our four panelists. We'll then have about 25 minutes for Q&A, including questions from the audience. Um, please note that to ensure a quality connection, all attendees will be muted. 
So you'll need to submit your questions for the panelists using the Zoom Q&A function. And also please upvote any questions that you'd like to see answered since we do um, have limited time today. The webinar will be recorded and can be shared and viewed later. It's now my pleasure to introduce our first panelist, Frank Pichel. Frank is the co-founder and chief programs officer at Cadasta Foundation with 15 years of experience designing, managing, and implementing land-related projects with a technology focus. Frank has worked with both the private sector in implementing programs globally, as well as designing and managing programs as part of the Land Tenure and Property Rights Office of the U.S. Agency for International Development. Frank, over to you. Great. Thanks for that, Amy. Much appreciate the introduction. So as, as noted, I manage our programs here at Cadasta Foundation, where we work to provide the tools, technology, and support to organizations working to strengthen land and resource right for those left out of formal tenure systems. We were launched in 2015, and, and since our launch, we've really seen steady growth in the number of partners, the users, and the number of households documented on the Cadasta platform and, and using our tools at Cadasta. That is until the onset of, Cadasta, uh, of COVID-19 earlier this year. From, from about February, we've seen a noticeable drop in new partners conducting data collection. If we jump back to that slide, we can see in the table at right that flat end. And unfortunately, that's where we are now, the last three or four months and the very limited new users collecting data in the field. But as we jump to the next slide, what we're seeing is that data collection has certainly largely stopped due to the restrictions and in, in, in movement globally. But what we're hearing from partners, if you want to go ahead and hit the slide, and the de development community alike, is that the data is more important than ever, particularly data relating to the location of people, and to structures, particularly those health facilities, the vital infrastructure, and things relating to the supply chains, food, water, services that are critical to be delivered. So it's more important than ever as governments and civil society to work together to respond to COVID-19. But we're seeing these, these data vacuums, places with very little formal data. These are more noticeable than ever particularly in our urban informal settlements and marginalized rural communities. And why is this data so critical? Well, the reason is this data is often driving the potential relief services from government and civil society alike, which, which are dependent on formal data sets. But critical to Cadasta, the work we do for capturing data is spatially enabled. So we're, our partners, when they're out in the field, they're not just collecting data about household impacts, how, how they feel about property rights, but also tying those responses to, 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 to locations. And with that, we can use the data to better understand where outbreaks are occurring, where part, partners or patients can access healthcare, where citizens impacted economically can receive support, and how to ensure adequate distribution of relief supplies. There's this growing recognition that in the absence of formal, uh, authoritative, accurate um, uh, government data, that this, this data that exists on this continuum is also uh, of, of validity and use, but just needs to be looked at um, in the right context. Next slide. But what seen at Cadasta is, is while we've had a drop off in field data collection activities, at the same time we've, we've pivoted to support our partners and see what else might be needed. And in fact, many partners have proactively come to us and said, we're unable likely to continue field, election, field data collection in the coming days and months, but we'd like to begin looking to use the data. So while our support for ongoing and new data collection has dropped off, considerably, we've pivoted to support partners with training so that they'll be more ready to, to continue data collection as the, as the lockdowns lift. We've really been supporting partners on migrating data and analyzing the existing data sets they have, so perhaps jumping to using their data before they have it fully complete. 
uh, and also looking to support our partners with COVID-19 related data collection projects. Because we recognize and our partners recognize that many of the same tools they've been using with Cadasta are just as relevant in the context of COVID. Collecting data, analyzing, all are possible within the Cadasta platform. And the suite of tools we build upon within the Esri framework. It's been really great to see our partners building on the school skills they already have and leveraging them for a different purpose. We just look forward to them coming back to, to continue working on property rights. Next slide. Well, at Cadasta, we've always seen technology really as a driving and, and a democratizing factor in allowing communities to directly capture and manage their land related data. Because we, we simply recognized really only through changing the tools and approaches that we can achieve the scale needed to bring the benefits of secure land and in property rights to the billions of people who remain tenure insecure. But the use of many of these tools, satellite imagery or drone imagery, cloud-based computing, smartphone or tablet-based applications for data collection, pairing with external GPS devices, again, are just as relevant in the COVID context, and perhaps more so, because they're allowing for more remote or locally-based mapping, uh, reducing the need for direct contact. We know that outside actors, government authorities, um, are not just going to be limited in the short term in their ability to collect data, but that distrust by outset, by communities to outside actors coming in remotely um, it is seen as a threat. We've heard this repeatedly from partners, how rural communities are limiting the, uh, the ability for outsiders to come in. They see it as a risk of infection spreading, particularly in India where we've had the mass migrations. So by using these remote tools, we're really empowering the local communities to collect the data themselves, reducing that risk on outside actors uh, getting involved, and then also leveraging the, the role of imagery so that instead of walking boundaries, perhaps, we can be picking boundaries, either as data collectors or as those beneficiaries. So in some sense, you know, this concept of using new technologies and, and the, the, the fit for purpose approach that's um, come to the forefront in recent years in the land sector, perhaps COVID in some ways will be a catalyst to really embedding this fit for purpose approach and ensuring it's kept, um, keeps the momentum moving forward. Next slide. So as noted, prior to COVID, Cadasta and our partners have already been, been largely working to leverage technology to more effectively secure land rights. Whether it's working with uh, Odisha State Government and Tata Trust in Eastern India and using a community-based approach where local actors use a combination of smartphones and imagery to document their property rights to a programs in Indonesia um, where rural farmers have used drone imagery to identify their many parcels which are spread over a, 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 lar a large geographic area eliminating the need to walk around and physically visit each parcel. While in Haiti, we've really built on that Tata and Odisha, uh, Tata and Odisha state government approach in using drone imagery and community-based data collectors. However, we're already re recognizing that there's going to be limitations for data collection. And we're hearing from governments about asking questions about how we can automate some of this data collection questions around using AI for identifying building footprints or parcel boundaries. And while there's some limits as to the effectiveness of, of those methods, particularly around parcel boundaries, we know there's a future in there. Um, so, and, and hearing the fact that governments that had often resisted this approach are now recognizing it might be viable in some context, even as a first step of data collection, as a way to reduce risk. But again, populate the critical data sets we all need uh, to allow for response to COVID as well as future disasters. So where does this take Cadasta? And looking at our next slide, in the short term, it means continued support of our, our partners with their COVID response, whether they're tracking local cases, whether they're tracking access to clinics, 
whether they're trying to attack, uh, to, to track health facilities. Um, but as we mature with that, also working to make sure that we're building in property rights issues to some of these ongoing data collection activities. Just simply understanding, is this a permanent home or a temporary? Do you own it? How was it acquired? Can, can really uh, shed a lot of light on the situation going forward and build up a data set of property rights that can incrementally be used to strengthen those rights. But perhaps most importantly for Cadasta and the big shift I think we've recognized internally is that in the short and perhaps medium, and we don't know when these uh, the restrictions on movement will be lifted, it means remote first. Uh, we've gradually been transitioning to remote training. I think we've uh, trained about eight organizations in the last two or three months but it's really put the pressure on us organizationally to develop training materials and the supported, um, uh, supported curriculum, et cetera, to allow for remote training and self-learning uh, for our partners so that we can continue with the work even in the absence of being on the ground with our partners uh, on, on a regular basis. So we will be releasing our Cadasta um, community portal in the coming, uh, probably the end of this month. Uh, and really look forward to our partners' interaction with this and this ongoing move towards towards more remote support. I think it reflects the reality we're, we're currently um, uh, realizing. Thank you, and with that, I'll turn it over to the next presenter. Great, thank you, Frank. Those were all um, very good examples of how technology is being used. And I, I think I wanna highlight a few of the key phrases that you mentioned that you know stuck in my mind, um, remote first, data is more important than ever which i think is becoming very clear to, to to the entire world and then also you know the empowerment of local communities to act themselves um, i think those are all things we, we we should all keep in mind going forward so for anyone who has um, questions for frank please um, put them in the q a and we will uh, take a turn of questions for all the panelists after they've uh, finished presenting I'd like to now introduce Christopher Burke, who is the Managing Director of WMC Africa and has almost 30 years experience working on development issues in East Asia and Africa. He has worked on both statutory and customary land related issues with a wide range of stakeholders, including the UNDP, the FAO, Global Land Tools Network, the World Bank, USAID, Japanese International Cooperation Agency, IGN, Oxfam, and Cadasta. Christopher has been based in Uganda for 20 years. He currently serves as the chair of the Northern Uganda Land Platform and was recently appointed secretary of the Subcommittee on Land and Agribusiness, an advisory board in the office of the president. Welcome, Christopher. Christopher, I think you're on mute. Thank you very much, Amy, for the uh, for the introduction, and uh, hello to all the participants. Um, just very brief, my, my uh, I, I'll talk a little bit about COVID, the impact of COVID in in Uganda, but it's really a snapshot of uh, or an example of some of the work that Cadast has been doing around the world, and I'll talk about the, the project in Uganda. Um, COVID basically has closed everything down. We've been on lockdown here for the better part of the last three months. Things have just started to open in the last couple of weeks. Um, government offices for the large part still remain closed. We have very tight curfew restrictions, so movement is limited and it's really just frozen um, any activities in any sector, really. Um, including land. I think one of the, uh, the medium long term impacts could be um, issues around funding. Um, from what I see, already there are strong indications. A lot of the, develop the traditional development partners are, are, are holding back, waiting to see before they, uh, they commit too much more um, support um, into Uganda. I think that's, that's driven by, by bigger geopolitical issues and, and their own economies as well. So first, I just wanted to give a, a, a snapshot, as I said, about uh, land tenure in Uganda. Um, Uganda's land laws are very very rich, very organized, and I would say for the large part, quite progressive. Um, it's one of the few countries, um, well, it was one of the first countries rather, where customary uh, land tenure um, was recognized on par with, uh, with other forms of tenure. Um, but less than 20% of the country's been registered in the last 20 years. So there's a large amount to be done. The World Bank has just finished 
um, a cutting edge program um, to, to, to uh, computerize the Ministry of Lands. And this has really driven um, a large a range of initiatives in statutory and customary land across Uganda um, over the last eight, 10 years. The mechanism for registering customary land was uh, outlined in the constitution in 95 and subsequent the, the uh, Land Act in 98. And that really forms the basis of, of a lot of uh, the work that's being done to try and bridge that gap, register that other 80% with certificates of customary ownership, which are primarily um, unsurveyed titles. So there's been a rush um, let me say over the last 10 years, many actors operating in Uganda, and you'll see on the slide there, I list a few of them, um, FAO, GLTN, of course, GIZ, ZOA, Humanitarian Street Maps, and, uh, and, and, and Google, and of course, Cadasta. So a large number of programs coming on. We have uh, over 20,000 now certificates of customary ownership and another 30, 40,000 certific certificates of tenure. So there's a great deal of data has already been collected and we've gone well beyond the, the pilot phase in the implementation of this. That said, none of these uh, customary uh, um, titles have yet been linked to the national land information system. This is a big gap and a priority for many actors operating here. Next slide, please. Hello, next slide. Yeah, thank you. So this is a, a rough uh, well, a map of, of uh, Bulisa, the, the area where the project has been implemented by by uh, Cadasta. Cadasta worked very closely with government of Uganda to identify this particular area. This is uh, where the oil exploration has only recently started. So let's put a lot of pressure on land um, and governments really pushed hard to, to try and organize land governance in that region. The uh, software that uh, Cadasta uses um, is based on the LADM um, structure and is compatible with the National Land Information Center. Cadasta worked with a, a number of smaller local organizations here. And as I said, worked very closely with government, both at the, the national level, but also at the local area uh, level with lo local government. Um, and a big part of this was uh, the implementation of a, a public awareness campaign to really inform the public what's happening and, uh, and how things are going forward. Next slide, please. So the challenges that we faced, COVID really, as I said, it came in and just locked everything down. So it's operation, it's a, it's a cause for reflection at the moment. There's a lot of um, preparations that are being made, but there's not really the capacity to get out in the field. Many of the benefits that uh, Frank suggested about uh, remote um, operation of land governance systems, of course, will come into play as we, as we go forward, as these systems are installed and, uh, and the country reopens. The biggest challenges are the, the same challenge we face right across Africa, and in fact, much of the developing world, is around access to infrastructure, data networks, roads, and such. Digital literacy, um, literacy of the population was also an issue, but, uh, but well, I'll talk about how, how some of the solutions and some of this as we go forward. <clears throat> um, gender discrimination um, it predominates or continues, perhaps not necessarily in the way that, uh, that we might look. I think it certainly needs greater scrutiny to be able to understand and deal with it. And land conflict of also, of also, is also um, persistent. The um, number of plots done under the project was 239, 240 plots, I think almost. Um, over a thousand people were, uh, were done. This was a pilot project. <coughs> excuse me, mirroring uh, many of the projects that other institutions are doing. The gender um, equitability has tried as, as we could, uh, we got 52% were men, 48% of the people registered were women, um, and 80%, 82% of the plots belong to families. There was an emphasis on families rather than individuals, but 14% uh, went to individuals. Next slide, please. Um, now, this really just gives a, a snapshot, again, of, of, of the, uh, the pandemic um, in Uganda. Um, we've been locked down, as I said, since beginning of March. Um, it hasn't really been so prevalent here. We've had 646 people tested positive, um, no deaths um, at the moment. Um, but as I said, movement continues to be 
um, very restricted. Um, so I think if th there's no, once, once curfew is lifted, we're able to get out into the field. And as long as we, we adhere to the safety precautions that have been issued by government, there shouldn't be any, any particular challenges. Next slide. Infrastructure, um, because this uh, Bulisa area uh, is, because of the oil exploration there, there has been increased uh, in government engagement and in infrastructure development across the region. And this certainly was a benefit to the implementation of the, of the pilot. A lot of training on literacy, um, but I think a lot of the work, or let me say the introduction, I underestimated some years back the impact of, uh, of phones um, and people's just capacity to be able to use electronic gadgets. Um, even the old, what I call uh, the, 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 the original phones became before the, the generation of before f smartphones that came out, just the, the psychology in, um, involved in operating those, I think really was a great introduction to, uh, to this sort of technology. And, and I've been surprised at the, the rapid take up within the community, but certainly more work needs to be done. The same with gender dis discrimination at every step of the way, we, uh, we really worked for uh, equality across gender, um, but that continues to be a challenge. Land conflict, I'm a bit pressed for time to talk about that um, particularly, but usually as uh, all of these projects, we don't implement where there's a land conflict. So we see um, land conflicts being resolved very, very quickly, but great caution needs to be required there. It, it needs, to, needs, is, needs to be uh, taken there. A lot of people are steamed rolled through by the community. This is an opportunity to register our land. You have to make this decision. So people will make concessions. Poor and vulnerable people will often be compelled by a wider audience or wider group of people to make concessions they wouldn't otherwise necessarily have made. So I think they need, these sort of programs need additional support and thought on, on that aspect as we go through. Next slide, please. Um, going forward, there's uh, a lot more support as required for, for government at, at, at many different levels, um, training just in processes. Um, we need to look again at the fees to make this uh, more sustainable at the local level. What, what can we charge um, the beneficiaries um, as a token? Um, and then increasingly making local government aware of the benefits of this in terms of, uh, we say the budgetary benefits of this, and uh, they'll be willing, more willing to support it as well. Um, incorporation of general maps needs to be uh, more seamlessly done in the next phase of the project going forward. Um, as I've already touched on, greater support to land conflict transformation. Development of handbooks, I think for sustainability as well, but this, this is time consuming and to do it properly, we need to consult very closely with government, of course, but uh, all of the stakeholders to make sure that these are meaningful and uh, facilitating owners access to the data captured. Now, this is a problem also, well, let me say it has, has legal issues or implications going forward, just how much people data can have. As I mentioned, the, the National Land Information System was recently established here, so, but it, it shows a lot less than it could, should, or perhaps will in the future. Thank you very much. Thank I think you, that's, that's my slides. I'm sorry, I rushed through there. That's okay, you'll but have I time welcome to- welcome questions and- yeah, so you'll have time to expand a little bit when we get to the Q&A, but thank you. And I think, uh, you know, many of these items that you've put forward as going forward um, in Uganda can probably be applied to other locations as well. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's good that we talk a bit about the persistence of gender discrimination. Um, that's obviously a, a huge problem in, in many parts of the world and also something we have to take into consideration as we, as we promote the uses of new technologies. Um, that sometimes leaves women out even more than they may already have been left out. So all great points and we'll come back to you at, in the Q&A. I'd like Thank to you. now introduce Emmanuel Tembo. Emmanuel has over 30 years of experience in land administration. He started his career as a land surveyor with the Lusaka City Council and has worked as a lecturer in land management and geomatics. Emmanuel has also been a consultant in the improvement of land administration systems and helped build human capacity in this, these areas. He's currently working as the project manager for the National Land Titling Program in Zambia 
as well as coordinating the national spatial data infrastructure development. Emmanuel, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, uh, Amy, for the introduction. And um, uh, welcome to this presentation, which is looking at um, the COVID pandemic and how it has affected us uh, in, in, in Zambia. You can go to, to our slide. Can I go to? Yeah, yeah we're looking at the, um, uh, how we can leverage technology um, given the COVID pandemic. Uh, and so maybe as a background, we can go to the next slide. As a background, uh, the, the government of Zambia has since 2017 in, started implementing the National Land Titling Program. This program is meant to title land uh, in state land. We have uh, about 20% state land and 80% customary land. Currently, we, as, as a country, we cannot title um, customary land because we do not have a land policy that, that would enable us to do so. And so, what we, the government has done is to start the um, titling only in state land, in areas where there's informal settlements, but it, it's in state land, then that area can be titled. So in terms of the process, uh, quickly, there are three main areas we can look at in terms of uh, how we are dealing with uh, the process itself of systematic land titling. And these are the processes that we are going to look at in terms of um, how COVID has affected uh, the whole process. We generally identify sites that need um, titling and where they, we identify these sites and I can be able to see boundaries on the aerial image, we then use author photos to carry out um, um, demarcations. We obviously will have to go back into the field and uh, then do what is known as social service to essentially sensitize the communities. As you can see in the picture there, we, um, this is what was one of the sensitization uh, meetings that was being done by the area member of parliament. Um, and then we have to number those properties Currently, this is being done in a national land titling system, which has been developed uh, between the ministry and uh, a partner institution called Medici Land Governance, who have helped us develop that uh, national land titling system. So when the properties are numbered, you can see the layout that is shown on the bot uh, um, upper right corner, that would show an area where we have gone in and carried out that sensitization and have then done the numbering. Then there's a process in which after this has been done, um, we require that clients who are in those areas should pay some amount of money to government um, as consideration fees. So this exercise is not entirely free uh, for the, communities, they are required to pay um, some amount to government to cover the costs. Um, so you can see that um, if you look at these two pictures, the one on the left and the one below, where the communities are ready for the verification, we can see that we tend to have huge crowds. And uh, what that has happened, what, what this means is that in the COVID situation, we could not no longer carry out these activities um, because of the nature of the process of uh, sensitization, which required us to go into communities. We had to, to stop the process. Um, we can go to the next slide. Next slide. Uh -huh. um, in terms of the field measurements that take place, we see here that uh, uh, we 
through our partner institutions or what we call service providers, we go out and collect data per household. And um, essentially then um, they will use tablets to carry out that information and there'll be particular information that is required for us to, to record um, the details of a piece of land. That piece of land, uh, that information is captured on a tablet, as I said, and the property boundaries are marked as the enumerators or the data collectors go out in the field. They will then map um, on the tablet. They will also have the signature of um, the owner's sign on the tablet. All that information uh, about ownership, for instance, if uh, they have a land, uh, a, a land record or a contract of sale for the property, all that is captured through the tablet. And so um, currently, due to the COVID uh, pandemic, we would, would not be able to carry out this uh, exercise. You can see the closeness, no social distancing that uh, normally would, uh, would take place during the field measurement. As a result, the ministry has had to rethink on how to undertake this uh, field work. And uh, there are now ways, uh, we're trying to see what could be the best way to carry out uh, the field work. Remember we said that the field work is required not only for property boundary identification, but also for the purpose of identifying who is actually sitting on that piece of land. Most of this land, as we've said, is uh, informal in nature. Uh, and so the records that people would have um, would not be, they are not full records. And so we have to do a lot of uh, counter checking and verification to ensure that we are collecting information for the right uh, person, uh, or the, right, the rightful owner of the property. We can go to the next slide. Next slide. Yeah, so um, what has happened then? Um, we have tried to, to work out, look at what are the issues regarding the field work and community sensitization. How do we ensure that we, we can still continue working um, uh, in the COVID um, situation? So we have internal workflows that we've had to look at as well as the field, as we go out in the field uh, for the data collection. Um, as Frank was say, indicating, data is very critical to the whole process and it has to be collected correctly. So um, tools have been developed to ensure that in terms of community sensitization, we shall begin to use bulk SMS to the communities. Uh, but that can only happen if we have collected the details of their phone numbers, we've collected all that information. So how do we do that? We still have to go into the field uh, and do some kind of sensitization through public announcements to say that we will need uh, information regarding um, property owners. We are now using um, uh, tablets to collect this information. And what we are now doing is to ensure that um, as we go out in the field, all the health guidelines that have been um, produced now under uh, COVID are, are maintained. The use of masks, the use of social, I mean, the social distancing aspect. So even in terms of interviewing our um, uh, people are sitting on these properties. Uh, all those aspects are being taught now to our um, enumerators or data collectors to ensure that they, they adhere to those uh, guidelines. Um, we have been lucky in one sense that we've, uh, um, in the state land areas, we have carried out aerial photos uh, and developed also photos in these, in these areas. Um, however, the data that we have is 20, I think 2017, 2018 aerial photos. 
along all the state land areas, we managed to do that. But what we are recognizing now is that um, um, data is, uh, especially in cities like Lusaka, is already becoming outdated. And so what we are now considering with the service providers is to look at areas where there are gaps in the aerial imagery that we have to do, to make, to carry out drone surveys. Um, and we haven't yet started this. We did a test in one of the areas in the, which was done. However, in the coming few months, it is expected that we are going to start using uh, drones to, to collect more information in areas which have uh, developed since 2017. As far as uh, internal workflows are concerned, the government is setting up what is known as the government service bus uh, because they have also recognized that um, services should as much as possible be online. So the service bus, which is an IT project, will then be linked to the Zambia Integrated Land Management Information System um, so that uh, most of the services that we are offering will then become online. As far as the title itself, the one that is shown on the left, titles um, traditionally in this uh, country at the ministry, we've been doing it, we have been uh, typing these titles. Um, so you can imagine if we are required to, to do 5 million titles, which is the target for, for the National Land Titling Program, 5 million titles by 2021. We recognize that uh, we cannot continue typing this. Um, and so we've uh, initiated a process where uh, the titles now in the National Land Titling System, which is linked to this uh, Zambia Integrated Land Management Information System, are uh, done electronically. <coughs> we have also recognized that uh, <coughs> the payment system has challenges. <coughs> Uh, we have serious challenges in terms of ensuring that payment um, platforms are increased. And so we have uh, engaged a bank called Zanapo, for example, to carry out, to who have uh, express agents all over, dotted all over the country to assist us in collecting um, the funds that we said are required to be paid before a, a title can be issued. We've also engaged MTN uh, mobile money, um, given the fact that a lot of people have phones. Basic phones can work with uh, the MTN mobile money and any other um, mobile operator. So we are engaging the various operators to, to help us in collection of funds. And we think that that will help uh, minimize contact with the, the people and uh, that uh, we can then be able to achieve the intended goal. <laughs> uh, Emmanuel, my apologies, yes. for, my apologies for interrupting. If you could um, maybe start to wrap up just so we have enough time for talking. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm wrapping up. Thank uh, you. Very, very quickly, the, we are also have pushed um, for legislation on electronic signatures, which we hope that this will happen very soon. In the, coming, in the coming parliament sitting, which has started today, we hope this matter will be brought into to parliament and we'll have uh, electronic signatures for um, our titles. We can go to the last um, slide quickly. Yeah, uh, some issues we, with regard to COVID response, we have uh, developed um, a COVID-19 dashboard for, for Zambia, where issues like contract, uh, contact tracing, mobility analysis, and risk analysis is being undertaken. What we do recognize, is obviously, is that um, there could be some marginalization for those communities that might not have the technology available to them. Um, and so we recognize that there has to be capacity building in, communi in communities to allow this technology to be inclusive. Otherwise, it will be technology that might disadvantage 
um, some communities. And so we are thinking that capacity building is critical to the use of such technology. I think I'll end here for in the interest of time. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. To be honest, I could listen to this all day, but unfortunately, we, we don't have the time to do that. So thank you so much. Um, let me introduce our last presenter. Thomas Vassen is the co-founder and CTO of Meridia, a venture that seeks to help landowners unlock the value of their land by providing them land documentation services and obtaining legal land title at scale. To date, Meridia provides its services to rural and peri-urban landholders in Ghana and Indonesia. And in the past decade, Thomas worked as a management consultant, co-founded startups, and worked to build the impact entrepreneurial ecosystem globally. Thomas, over to you. Thanks, Amy, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Good evening, maybe. Um, good to meet you over Zoom. Uh, yeah, I also have about 10 minutes to, to give you a, a brief introduction on our work and, and particularly the impact of COVID and how we are um, how we are responding to that. So we can go to the next slides. Just as an introduction, um, what Meridia does, is, as Amy already highlighted, um, we are focusing mainly on smaller farmers. That's really our target uh, audience. We are for-profit enterprise. Um, and what, what, we, what we've worked towards over the last six years since we started um, is more and more to embed our work in uh, value chains. And that's sort of a, a new, you could say, a sector that, that hasn't you know, historically been much involved in this kind of work that's waking up to the, to the fact that this is key in making supply chains more sustainable, um, traceable, um, and to, to maintain sort of a, a sort of sourcing uh, of, for example, cocoa and oil palm and, and all of that in a way that doesn't lead to more deforestation um, and the deprivation of livelihoods and land grabs. So we have large companies such as Unilever, Mondelez, and Hershey uh, backing us up uh, working with us um, to provide their smaller farmers with, with land title. Alongside, they're benefiting from the data that we're gathering, which is much more accurate than what they usually capture. So that's our sort of unique positioning in this, in this sector. We go to the next slide. Um, yeah, here, uh, just a, a sort of oversight, overview of where we're at with, with our activities. Um, for us also COVID came out of left field. Um, we didn't expect it to sort of have such grave um, impacts. Um, we have, you know, highlighting three countries where we're operating in Ghana, we've been active um, for a long time with, with a larger team. Um, and we've, we've seen two months of sort of complete stop of field work and we've, we've reinitiated field work as of May. Um, Indonesia, um, it's also come to a stop where we're expecting uh, things to be coming back online from July. Um, but, but as of now, it's still sort of in a semi lockdown in, in Cote d'Ivoire. It's a bit similar to Ghana. Uh, it's possible now to travel, but you need quite, uh, you need to, to do a blood test and, and get clearance. So it's not easy. Uh, apart from these government sanctions, there's also um, just the fact that, you know, urban to rural travel, um, we need to also factor in the perception of, of risk and the way that communities are welcoming uh, people from cities and, you know, to not be seen as spreading a, a virus, taking all the necessary precautions and, and really limiting um, field activity as much as possible um, to, to not, you know, have any role in potentially spreading the virus. Um, also, just to give you a flavor, what's our work like in this time, you know, since a few months, uh, there's a short video of which we'll play just about 10 seconds, um, which is what's been happening, for example, a week ago. Unfortunately, most of you won't speak. Uh, but this is one of our agents explaining to farmers the, the relevance of uh, land rights documentation as well as actually registering the species on the farm. We can, we can pause the video again.
Um, you know, what, what this shows is that indeed farmers are, we can do sensitizations, which this is, you know, far, but farmers are spread out. You know, sometimes we have groups up to 50, now we're working with groups of five or maybe 10. Um, people have disinfectants and face masks and um, we're gen generally more inefficient. We're more slowed down in the work, but we can work. Um, and also, I must say many of the farmers don't often also perceive the risk and are complaining why they need to wear face masks and all of that. Um, but um, yeah, it gives you a sense of what work is like uh, these days. So we can go to the next slide. What we're seeing um, and sort of our reflections on, on, on the COVID pandemic and, and how it particularly affects land registration work. So our work is, is more on the first registration of customary parcels, not so much on the administration of it. And that's also what other people have been talking about. Um, that what we've been calling the participatory mapping model, which you can see on the left side, um, is really actually um, a good fit. What it does, instead of bringing a larger group of, um, you could say, experts, surveyors, uh, enumerators um, from a city into a village to capture data, you only bring two or three um, people, and you run a training, and you get the community to then take the devices and map their own parcels, map the entire community in, this, in, a, in a period of four to eight weeks. Um, this greatly reduces the, um, the transport and travel between cities and, and, and villages, which, which is really, I think, the, the way in which the dryer spreads um, the most. Um, and then the other point is then, um, yeah, using as much as possible digital devices, uh, such as tablets, um, which, we, which we always um, want to stress within any country is, is what should happen because that reduces the number of documents or other materials that need to be changing hands. And so again, you reduce the risk of exposure to the virus. So um, what we are seeing is that these are sort of additional, this is sort of additional ammunition to convince um, both local and national level institutions to go digital um, as well as to go participatory. Um, of course, as you, as all of you know, there's many other reasons why participatory approaches are um, are, um, are are beneficial. Um, the cost aspect, um, more more gender inclusiveness, um, etc., are all part of that. But we're not focusing on COVID, so not going into that. Um, secondly, what can we do remote? Right. So as as Frank was also mentioning. Um, we don't need to go to the field, let's not do it, let's work remote. What we're seeing with our projects is that um, we're trying to engage different uh, channels in which we can share information and documents, uh, scans of documents over mobile phones. Um, not all our farmers have smartphones, but it's, it's, it's possible to identify a few um, representatives in the community that have and that can be an agent to be able to uh, collect data and, and scan documents, um, which often, uh, which often is needed. Also, after enumeration exercise, some 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 back and forward querying of, of questions of data needs to happen, and this can this can actually be done remote, more through phone calls, through um, you know a help center, and so so all of that, I think, is is pushing us to be more remote, not just from our headquarters to the implementation countries, but with, you could say the implementation country office and the uh, implementation villages more or less. So we're trying to reduce that um, uh, physical exchange there. Um, yeah, to have small group sensitizations, as you've seen in the video, um, limited to five people or 10 people, depending on the, the regulations in the country. Um, and then Lastly, there's still also still the option to do more client engagement engagement over the phone for even the first level interaction to uh, engage them over the phone, which is something we're, we're trialing in, in, in Ivory Coast, um, where um, we're actually getting lists of farmers from cooperatives, from farmer cooperatives, and we are actually doing the first interviews over the phone before even having had physical contact, um, which 
brings in additional challenges, but we are seeing that is possible. Um, of course, drones um, is something that, you know, uh, is, is, is one way to, to try and simplify the process, having high resolution base maps that allow us to draw parcels and, and um, reduce the need for terrestrial mapping, um, which reduce costs, but also um, yeah, reduces the need to be in the field. Um, and we have projects where that can um, be applied for up to 70% of the parcels, such as rice, rice fields, for example, are a very good example of that. Um, so just these are some of the things that we are implementing and we're seeing being implemented in other projects as well. Next slide, please. Um, well, of course, um, what's also important is that we as a sector move more towards an interoperable um, way of, of um, collecting this data and having less sil siloed data, uh, more accessible data. Of course, taking care of the necessary security um, and privacy uh, measures. Um, and for that, we think there should be more cloud-based solutions um, which have flexible data infrastructures and APIs that can be easily, easily linked. Um, not every API is an API that can actually be easily used. And we have need to have secure data with strong permissions and access management. So uh, more advanced user permissions and, and, uh, and settings for this kind of data to be both secure, uh, private, but also to be uh, shared with the relevant authorities uh, as and when. Next slide. So what we're seeing, um, we see more integrated solutions coming online in this sector. Um, we see more participatory mapping happening. So that's really a trend that's here to stay, engaging the entire community in this kind of activity. And we see more increased use of mobile devices. Um, and these are things, trends we think are only gonna um, keep growing. And then there on the, on the right side, there's a bit of a mess up, but um, what we see as gaps is still much, many much software is still not easy to customize. It's, it's too generic. It's not tailored to the specific needs of a certain area, certain community, um, certain country even. Um, and so that's where I think many projects still struggle um, and many and, and several pieces of software aren't, aren't really made to be easily uh, tailored this way. Um, and then if you look at uh, solutions that, that need to reach submeter accuracy, which in, in several countries is a requirement for titling, that is still um, a challenge for many solutions. And, and that's one of the, 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 the places where uh, Meridia sort of um, excels. Um, I think this is my last slide, but maybe we can check. There's still mm -hmm. one more slide. No, that's it. So uh, with that, I, I will be... Um, closing my introduction um, and open for questions for the audience. Thank you very okay. much. Great, thank you, Thomas. And you know, there were, were certainly a lot of good practical solutions and recommendations there, as well as some echoes of, you know, previous presenters in terms of remote first or, you know, community independence and empowerment. So I think there's themes that are threading through the different um, country examples. I think, Thomas, you actually answered the first question I was going to, an to ask. So I'm going to um, skip you and ask the other three panelists this question, yeah. and then I'll come back to you later. And that question is, what successful technology-based approaches to land administration or lessons learned during COVID do you think might be continued into the future? Um, and Emmanuel, why don't we start with you? Yeah, thanks. And uh, what successful tech-based um, approaches. Yeah, I think we, as we said, uh, since the COVID started, uh, we've had, um, we've really slowed down. What we are seeing in terms of um, how we can move forward is um, the use of um, communicating tools to get to the people uh, through bulk SMSing. Uh, as one way which will enable us to, to reach out to the people as, the, as we approach them. Um, the use of um, drones to capture more data uh, for the boundaries, so we can do that remotely. Um, 
The only challenge with that though is that um, if there's no uh, physical boundary, we still have to go into the field to identify where this, uh, these boundaries are. Um, so I think, yeah, the bulk SMSing and uh, the use of drones would help us minimize uh, community contacts, uh, I believe. Great, thank you. Um, Frank, for you, successful approaches or lessons that we'll use going forward. Sure, thanks for that, Amy. Um, the, the first one, and one I, I don't think we can stress enough, is, is really prioritizing those, those training materials and supporting videos, exercises, curriculum, so that we're, we're ready to continue supporting, you know, regardless of what, um, what pandemic or disaster might, might befall us. Um, but that said, there's a couple of other points that I think we've adapted and added to our, um, to our, to our tool belt, if you will. Um, one, and I think this was mentioned by Thomas, is, is you know, using phones for that first round of data collection. And there was, a, I think, a question that popped up in the Q&A um, regarding how, where the numbers come from. And certainly that's only a valid approach if it's a known entity or we're working with partners that already have relationships within the community. But separating those face-to-face -face interactions as much as possible. Um, another one would be the use of even more localized data collectors. You know, we say we are using people from the community. Well, you might be talking about a community that's a, a slum of 200,000 people, right? Um, so bringing it down to the block level almost and talking to one of our partners, um, Spatial Collective in Kenya, you know, they were using data collectors almost at the block level where it was, what can you see from your window? You're locked down, but what, what, what things do you physically know about without leaving the house? And you probably got time on your hands to do this data collection. Um, and the final one I, I might add is, is somewhat related, but I think more closely managing the, the data collectors. Um, within our tool set and within the, the Esri uh, tools, there's, there's the workforce application. And we, we're, we're starting to look at how do we use that to deploy the data collectors so that we know they're going uh, um, to the most uh, closely approximate some locations, most efficient movements, and really, again, limiting the time outside and, and with these face-to-face -face interactions. So as opposed to kind of broadly dispersing the, the uh, data collectors, really focusing them on, on discrete areas. Thanks. Great, lots of, lots of good suggestions there, Frank. Um, Christopher, same question for you. And you're, yeah. Yes, as, as, uh, as I mentioned, um, we've been very much under lockdown, so it's really hard to say. We haven't done very much implementation in the, in the new normal um, of this program, but, but I can see that uh, it, it cost is going to be a big driver. You know, as there's less funds available um, moving forward, I think people will look more effective, uh, cost effective ways to, uh, to move forward with de land demarcation, registration. And certainly already in Uganda, we can see them doubling down or re-looking re at opportunities and ways that they can, they can cut costs going forward using some of the technologies that are available. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, Frank, I have a question from the audience. Um, for you. Let me just have a little trouble moving my, okay, here we go. How does Kandasta ensure the privacy of data collected in communities? Are there agreements that specify the ownership of the data and sharing protocols? Do any of these activities have the potential for revenue generation? And if so, how would it be shared with communities? Excellent. Okay, sure. Lot, lots of questions to, mm -hmm. to unpack there. Um, certainly, you know, at the maybe I'll tackle them in order. Um, data privacy and the data ownership. Um, we're fairly explicit in stating that the data is not ours. It belongs to our partners and the communities they work with. Cadasta is merely the, the repository or steward of that, that data. Now, how that data is shared is something we, we really spend time working with our partners on, on, on making decisions on how to make the data open and what level of openness is appropriate. Um, while organizationally, we broadly uh, push for open data and property rights, we recognize that each situation is, is different. And perhaps putting a, a vulnerable community on, on a map and noting that they are in fact a vulnerable community could make them a target. Um, 
So out of the box, we kind of have five, four or five, five options for level of privacy, all the way from you're going to share the parcel details, no personally identifiable information, but parcel details, boundaries, et cetera, up to the most extreme, which is on our platform. If, if you all go to our global dashboard, you could drill in and see that there is a project in Uganda, for example. Um, and if you queried that project, there'd be no data other than perhaps to contact me, and I could potentially link you all with that um, with that partner. There's always that question of, of how do we leverage the data and make it available for research, which is something we're constantly thinking about um, and, and would like partners uh, to be able to do. So feel free to reach out to me directly if you, if you have any questions on accessing that data, but, but do take a look. Um, and finally, as Cadasta, as a as a nonprofit, um, we're not currently, you know, reselling data or leveraging it. Um, but we have worked with communities to look at how they can use the data to leverage it at an individual level, perhaps to access benefits from state subsidies or micro insurance, microfinance, um, up to 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 um, you know fuller uh, uh, sharing and making available of that data. So I hope that addresses the question. Thanks, Amy. Oh, great. Thanks, Frank. Um, a question for Emmanuel. How are local authorities, decentralized authorities, involved in the process in Zambia? Um, I thank you for that question. We work with uh, local authorities um, from the first step was when all properties are identified in a local authority. So the local authority is the one that gives um, what we call demarcation areas. Um, so working together, we identify a demarcation area and plan <clears throat> according to the Urban and Regional Planning Act, any area which is to be titled has to be planned and uh, the local authorities then carry out those plans and um, develop those plans together with us and uh, approve those plans <clears throat> if they are a planning authority. And so we work together through the process of sensitization of the communities because the local authority are the ones with um, the foot soldiers as it were. So yeah, um, all the way up to the process of uh, ensuring that uh, we are getting closer to the title. So we work through with, with the local authorities all the way. Yeah, I submit. No, that's great. Thank you. Um, a question for Thomas. In Ghana's context, majority of the smallholder farmers do not own the land. So the question is, to what extent are secondary land right holders Abunu and Abusa arrangements captured in the process of customary land rights documentation. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I saw that question for Fessus. I was just also answering uh, by typing, but it is a it is a reality in Ghana that most farmers we work with have the secondary rights. There is the the official ownership is with the uh, chiefs who represent us, what is called a stool. Uh, we, we, which, is, which is kind of a tribe. Uh, so ownership is, you usually don't talk about ownership, you talk about a bundle of rights. And um, in, in cocoa farming, there's very specific packages of rights that have been, you know, sort of orally transmitted over generations. Um, and now we are documenting them for the first time. So it's very important that those are documenting, documented correctly, accurately, and, and they are quite, they had sort of slight differences in each area that you work with. So you can't sort of blanket out an approach. Um, so, but this is our particular focus. Uh, we, we, we almost, you know, fully only work uh, in this kind of context. And that means that we spend usually nine to 12 months in each area to build rapport with the traditional authorities, build templates for these kinds of rights. Um, in, in consultation with, with legal experts, with farmer associations um, and NGOs. Um, and that comes to a sort of MOU that we have on the one hand with the chiefs, on the other hand with the farmers, um, that then sets the stage for that, uh, that rights documentation to happen. 
so it becomes a campaign that chiefs join into, farmer leaders join into, and each, each community takes part. And many of the concerns are already addressed in that initial stage. For example, in Ghana, cocoa farmers um, want to replant their cocoa trees, which are getting old or diseased. The usual arrangements is that if you cut your cocoa trees, you are basically for foregoing, giving your land back to the chief. This has to be then being made part of the new template that you can replant your trees, you replant your cocoa without having to pay again for your land. So such, such issues are, are cropping up, and which is one of the main reasons why farmers want documentation is that they can be rest assured, they can rehabilitate their farms, uh, improve their productivity of their farms without losing their land. Um, so there's many details and, and issues, but um, at this point, um, I think that, yeah, this is our main focus to, to figure this out and, and it's working well. Great, thank you. Um, we only have about five minutes left. So I think what I'll do is take one of the questions for all of the panelists. And if you could each do a very rapid response and, and then we'll wrap up, that would, um, that would be fantastic. Um, and this actually is a good follow on to Thomas, just to, a little bit about what you were talking about. The question is, what could critical policy, what should critical policy considerations be to consider enabling versatile technology innovations and uses for land administration and management? So critical policy uh, considerations to enable it. Um, Thomas, why don't we, we start with you and, and work our way backwards? Good, Jeff, for this one, I'll try to keep it uh, sure. I think for, for the two things that I, that I mentioned on the slide already, one, we need, um, you know, we need, we need governments to, to, to fully back up a participatory, a fit for purpose approach. They need to realize that rural land registration requires um, scale reduction of costs and that doesn't make sense to, to stick to two to five centimeter uh, technocratic kind of uh, approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we need to open up to one or two meters, maybe we need g proper GNSS equipment, but, but, you know, fit for purpose and with the participatory approach. And then secondly, to, to be able to enable full digitized registration. Um, and that's often still difficult. We can use tablets, but once you want any kind of official to sign off on it or show, then you still have to print it out, you know, show it, move back and then scan that back in. And so then the process becomes very cumbersome. So, um, and these are often regulations that are written down in decrees, you know, for, 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 from, from parliament. And it's very difficult to change that kind of policy. Um, so you need to sort of have all kinds of um, workarounds. But, but these are, to me, the key, key three things we need. Thank you. Um, Emmanuel, over to you. And if you could keep it very brief, that would be fantastic. It's an interesting question that uh, I think for me, um, I would like to see a situation where electronic uh, records are kept as, uh, as a law um, so that um, in the end, in terms of policy, we are able to refer to the electronic record as the basis of any, any uh, land ownership. That mm -hmm. way we would know that um, we are leveraging um, te technology to the benefit of um, uh, our people. Mm -hmm. Very important, thank you. Christopher? You're on Lifted, mute. as I said. There we go. I'm sorry, I keep doing. In Uganda, we have the benefit, of course, of the National Land Information System. We've had two phases of this supported by the by the World Bank, as I said, to computerize the ministry. So already a lot of thought and attention has been given to exactly this issue. Progress is slow. There's still a lot of info, still a lot of work to be done in terms of uh, implementing or enacting the, the laws to be able to recognize uh, data, um, electronic data, um, and the efficacy of the legal efficacy of this. Um, so we still have a, a dual paper um, digital system. So, so more needs to be done. Patience, I think, is the way to get these through. It needs to be consistent and patient, and uh, and and very and longer time frames than than many development partners uh, are willing to offer when they come into uh, to these sort of projects. Thank you, 
I think that's it in short. Great, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Um, two things come to mind as we think about, you know, what are the policy considerations that will really enable tech, tech innovation? And the first I would say is for, for governments to, to not focus on the technology per se, but the data standards. Don't try to always keep up with the latest tool, with what's out there in hardware, focus on how the data comes in and that it meets that national data standard. Um, and the second would be, you know, really, and, and what we're starting to see, and I, I alluded to earlier, um, but that recognition of, of fit for purpose processes. I think we're really recognizing that incremental data collection um, is probably a need, the needed approach. And some data, even if not perfect, is better than, than no data, which is the reality we're, we're faced with in a lot of places and what is, of course, impacting the ability to respond to COVID-19 and other disasters. Thank you. Well said. Um, and I had you know, prepared a, a couple of comments to close up, but I would rather hear from all of the panelists. So I will skip those and just go um, to thanking everyone for participating. I'm sorry that we did not get to all of the questions but hopefully um, you found it useful and perhaps some of the panelists might, um, might wanna respond in writing if they have some time, we'll, we'll talk about that afterwards. But thank you again um, and have a good rest of your week. Thanks all. Thank you. Have a good week. Thank you. Cheers everyone. Bye-bye.